Welcome to A1 TV, The Mark Show. Another night, another great guest. And tonight, we're going right across the Apple Isle to Tasmania. I like looking for stories that have got a bit of a human element. And tonight, I'm going to talk to a friend of mine who I've known for a long time now and I had a bit to do with. But his story is amazing. Introducing James Wiggins. How are you, mate? Yeah, really well, thank you. Now, we go, we talk about, we want to talk about stories and, you know, people's life journey. And I want to know your football career as a young child or young kid, James. Obviously, grew up in Hobart Mark in a suburb called Moona, which is out towards the northern suburbs and took an interest in football early. Played soccer at school and a bit of football at school, but um, took an interest in the old TFL back in the days in the 80s and uh, really enjoyed watching the Norfolk and Glenorchy back in the 80s with uh, good crowds and had some cult heroes and like Wayne Fox and Ricky Hanlon and so forth, and uh, that's where I started. What were you like as a football or soccer player or what sports did you play and how good were you? Soccer was great, actually. I went away with the Tasmanian side to New South Wales in 1984 when I went to high school, I really wanted to become an AFL footballer, and unfortunately, that didn't uh, come to fruition. How did you come about where you decided that you wanted to get in football? I was just a passion. I uh, met some wonderful people and just wanted to emulate what they were doing. And as a kid growing up in the northern suburbs, as I got a bit older, I realised that getting to Boya when you know, like were playing was difficult to watch a home game. So uh, I got on board with the Magpies, Glenorchy, and took a massive interest in them and had some heroes there. Obviously, Mickey Webster and Matthew Coyne and a few mates of mine from high school and also club days um, went on to AFL and that's where it all started. Yeah, you, know, you and I have had this conversation about um, using common sense, having good work ethic and work rate and uh, the ability to think outside the box. Where'd that ability come from, Weo, where you actually can look at a project and say, well, I know what that's got to happen. Where does that skill come from? Some people can't learn that. That's just something that's inbred in them. Yeah, for sure. Obviously, as a young attacker, mum and dad weren't that keen on football. Mum was fantastic going to my soccer and stuff. But um, I used to have uh, like a second set of parents at the Glenorchy Football Club that whilst they were at the football club, I was allowed to visit the social facilities as well. So on a Saturday night, I'd stay back at the club rooms for a couple of hours. And once those people left, I'd had to leave. But I guess going along to various functions and sort of getting in with people and getting to know how they work, just observing things and going, this would work here and this may not work there. And I just picked it up from there and had a genuine passion to to probably more so push the football administration side of things than, uh, than play the game. Where was your first club? It was Burnie, actually. Yeah, obviously got a wonderful opportunity. I'd come back from Melbourne at the end of 2000 and was battling away. And I went to John Klug, who was working at Mission Employment at the time, and I said, can I send my football resume to every football club and league in Australia? He sort of looked at me joking. And I said, well, you're not paying for it. The government are. So I earmarked a few clubs in Tasmania, North Launceston, and Football Tasmania at the time, and the Burnie Dockers. And um, by chance, I got a phone call from Burnie um, I mean, late August that year, unbeknownst to me, Mick McGowan, the Collingwood legend, was coach manager. He was in the process of finishing up at the end of the year. So that's how it all started. You had a year at Werribee and that was a bit of a catalyst for your uh, entry into football we got. That was fantastic. Obviously, um, I was back in Tasmania and I actually took up an opportunity with AFL Taz that I don't have fond memories of, to be honest with you, Stoney, but there was an opportunity and um, I brought Kerry O'Keefe over for a weekend um, in June and Taz were playing Werribee at North Hobart and we had over 300 50 people at the Rest Point Casino on a Saturday night and I remember Greg Turtle Welsh in the early hours of Sunday approached me saying young man would you like to come to Melbourne and obviously being a football head what an opportunity and I just thought it was sort of a, a bit of talk at the time and then I got a phone call three or four weeks later from Turtle saying where's your resume and so that's how it sort of happened and uh, it was a wonderful experience my role was created unfortunately that year the Bulldogs were affiliated with us um, we had one rookie at the time Tom Davison unfortunately struggled um, we had long term injuries to Mitch Hahn, Bob Murphy and so forth. And back then the club would budget for 12 Werribee guys or 13 Werribee guys and eight Bulldogs players. And as you know, Stoney, when they play VFL, the AFL players, they're on their base contract. So we don't have to pay them. But unfortunately, contracts with other players that were sort of on the fringe were buffed up to obviously keep them on board. And we end up with 19 or 20 Werribee guys and one Bulldogs player. So I knew the budget was blown out. And unfortunately, because my role was created, it was the first to go. But yeah, I love that football. Let's go back to your uh, to your Bernie days and uh, what you actually learned from your time in Bernie because we'll go through your football journey because it's important that the viewers understand where you are today, which will go down the track. But tell us about your journey at Bernie and what you learned there that you took on further down the track with your footy administration life. Uh, it was an amazing journey. Obviously, they won the premiership undefeated in 2001. I went up a couple of weeks prior from the interview, really got put on a, a bit of a learning trend with a traineeship initially. Things escalated from there and we went on to a contract 
which was wonderful. So I guess Mick, 12 months earlier, the club financially was in a bit of a world of hurt and had Eddie McGuire come down and they raised 30 odd thousand in one day, which is absolutely amazing. And from my point of view was how do we emulate that? Obviously, you need to set standards and I'm a great believer. I don't believe the wheel turns. I think the wheel turns if you force it. So it's about maintaining standards and becoming better. So getting to Bernie, how do I make our football club better? So obviously one from my, my point of view is wherever I've been, I've tried to have a relationship with the playing group because the playing group know people that we don't. They're the ones that should be members, sponsors or, or people just coming in for a feed on a Thursday night. So I had a really wonderful relationship with the playing group. I wrote letters to John Elliott, who was Colton president at the time under the pump, Kerry O'Keefe, who was on the fat. And those guys rang me in. And Kerry O'Keefe, for instance, says, what's a little football club on the northwest coast want me for? And I said, your laugh's infectious. He was sensational. John Elliott was under the pump with the salary cap issues with Carlton at the time. Brings me up one morning, says, pick me up in the airport, take me to the function, take me back to the airport. I said, an appearance fee. And he said, I'll reiterate, pick me up in the airport, take me to the function, back to the airport. You know, it was just amazing. And we had some wonderful times. We had Sam Newman come down. But it was about maintaining standards and stuff and, and also trying to connect with the community. They were a bit disenchanted um, with the Cooey Bernie Tigers situation and then the Bernie Hawks and then the Dockers come around in 1995. So unfortunately, the footy club lost some people. But I've got to be honest with you, Stoney, we had some wonderful volunteers. The Women's Committee did a lot of catering outside. They are wonderful people. And I really cherish my time at West Park. They gave me the opportunity to do something they love and uh, really grateful. And obviously, I was there for three and a bit years and we, we won flags every year at senior level. Um, and we made good profits as well. And then an opportunity to come up to um, get back to Hobart and, yeah, go to AFL Tasmania. And then, you spent, as you said, it, it, um, you had some experiences there and um, obviously things journey happened. Some are short, some are long. But then you um, then you went on to, to Devonport, back to the coast. Well, after AFL Tasmania, it was Werribee. And then yeah, I come right. back to Tasmania. I've had a few interviews on the mainland. I had, I had interviews with North Melbourne, Geelong, Hawthorne, and also AFL Victoria for various roles. At one stage, Hawthorne were coming to Tasmania, if you remember, back then, and Shane Stevenson ended up being the, the general manager in Tasmania. We actually thought there was two roles at one stage, and Steve O and I had a reasonable relationship, and he thought, with my background on the northwest coast and around Launceston Way, that we could do the job together, and he'd look after Hobart, and I'd look after the coast, but unfortunately, it was a, there was a senior role and a junior role. So I got back to the coast, a good mate of mine at the time, who I really admired from a distance, Dale Perry, coach Devonport, and they were obviously in trouble in the statewide financially, but also weren't successful, and in my time at Burnie, he'd got into to the grand final um, without being successful. And I always thought, geez, it'd be great to work with a bloke like that that really had nothing to work with financially, but also for him to develop a playing group to, to get the final result. And that was a great experience. I had two years at Devonport and very grateful for that opportunity too. Obviously a club that was struggling financially, but you're robbing Peter to pay Paul, but also trying to have success on the field and move forward. And, you know, we finished minor premiers in 2007 and unfortunately bombed out in two finals. But, you know, generally the club was in a really good place. And in 2000, and it was a tough year. Dale retired at the time, moved on, and we had an exodus of players. Matthew Langmate had been a long-term player, wanted to get into the coaching caper and thought best to move on and see it from another angle, which I thought was a pretty smart move after being at the club for about 14 years. I think we turned over about 1,200 games of experience, but once again, we had some fun. Uh, it was an interesting journey and i um, very grateful for the time there. Then you went down to Glenorchy. I yes. want you to tell the listeners, the viewers about your time at Glenorchy and the night Jason Akamanis come to town. Tell us about that and how that came about, we go. Yeah, so obviously I got down there at the end of uh, 2008 and took over the general manager's role early in 2009. Once again, you put in practices, you learn everywhere, and some things don't work somewhere and they work better elsewhere. So we had a great year. Unfortunately, grand final day, uh, got pipped at the post. 2010 was a really tough year. We played finals again Stony, but um, off field was good. The club's in a really healthy situation, and I always remember going to a committee meeting with various people. And the club thought we needed to try and do something to obviously get people involved with footy again and get some interest in the game. And said, "Geez, it'd be great to get an AFL player to play a one-off game or something." So, Mr. Ackermanis' name bobbed up, and he happened to be talking at the old Tudor Motor Inn in Launceston on a Friday night. I was going through to watch a statewide final between Devonport and Launceston, and uh, was staying at the old Tudor, and we got there late myself and a former partner and that function was well underway so I thought I won't go there and then I approached the guy that I knew reasonably well Chris Hawkins 
And I said, what are you doing tomorrow? He said, we're having breakfast before we head to Lauderdale. I said, do you mind if I'm here? And he said, what for? And I said, oh, I want to ask that for a question. And he said, what's that? And I said, will he play one game of football in my club? And he said, oh, you'd be wasting your time. I said, well, I'll be the judge of that. So next morning I got up at 6.30, went down to the breakfast room, and three hours later, Acker wanders in, and he sort of acknowledges me, but puts his head in the paper. And fortunately, I knew that he'd spoken at a function in country Victoria that week with Dougie Hawkins, who's a good mate. I said to him, I said, how'd that function go with Hawk? And he looked up and how do you know Hawk? And we got talking. And at the time, um, Stoney, the State League had about 30 games of AFL experience. You had uh, Cameron Thurley who played 12 or 13 with Kangaroos in Geelong. Andrew McLean had played half a dozen with uh, St Kilda. Luke Shafflin had played one with Collingwood and Ken Hall had played one. And that was it. Half hour later, after having a chat with Ashley, he goes, how about I play a dozen games in finals? My jaw dropped. And I said, well, how about we fire you down at a time that suits you? You can have a look at our facilities, which... They've certainly been upgraded in the last five or six years uh, since then. But come down, have a look, and we'll go from there. So we flew him down. He couldn't believe it. He mentioned how he's playing at Williamstown at Point Gellibrand. Our facilities were better than Williamstown's at the time. Saw the finances of the footy club that were in a sound position and said, I've still got a bit of wheeling and dealing to do. Keep in touch. And um, I did that. And I know you're a couple of clubs in Perth were chasing him, but he wasn't keen on getting on the red-eye flights. And he was about to go on radio for MTR in Melbourne, if you remember that station. So yeah. he wasn't keen on getting on the red-eyes. So I was about to fly over for for a um, ex-relations christening. And Ackett rang me and goes, what are you up to? And I go, well, I'm coming to Melbourne tomorrow. He goes, good, I'll see you at Moody Ponds at this restaurant Saturday morning, I'm ready to sign. So I uh, went over, not a big brown paper bag, Stoney. <laughs> Um, but went over and it was fantastic. And anyhow, he did pre-season. And, and I remember the first training session at KG5. There would have been more people to train than what we've had at a roster game all year. And I think the footy club gave away about 800, 900 sausages that night. And just a buzz factor. And everyone was really excited. And we had some fun and games with AFL Taz. Believe it or not, staying. They didn't want to register uh, Acker at the time, which is just ridiculous. But we pushed through that. And he did the pre-season camp. He got to two or three sessions early in the new year. He got to our jumper presentation night. And then obviously round one was a perfect setup. Starting we played Clarence, who in Tasmania is our the massive arch rivals. It was the week before the season started. It was a perfect night. It was the first night of lights at KG Five, and we thought we'll get four or five thousand people. And I'm looking up from my office, then looking across the ground at the YMCA and also Northgate behind me. Midway through the second quarter, there's still people trying to get in the ground. Uh, it was like a rock concert. I think we worked it out. There was eight thousand four hundred and eighty paying customers, but we didn't count the freebies and the kids and also the concessions and stuff. So we reckon probably 11,000 people got to that game. It's like the Kerry Packer with the Sydney Career game when the, when the night series started on the first ever night game. <laughs> Open the gates, James. Open the gates. It was amazing. It was really good. You know, I know that you follow Tasmanian State League and keep an interest in what's going on. And I genuinely believe this, and it's not to be arrogant or not, I don't believe the game itself or the competition itself has had any interest since then, which is really sad. I'm a great believer in statewide football. That's for another day, Stoney. But, you know, as I said, it was a buzz factor. And the first year of statewide in 2009, after the inaugural state league, was can Burnie beat Clarence? Can Devonport beat Lenorchy? You know, can Hobart beat South Launceston? And, and it was a really exciting time. And unfortunately, from 2009 onwards, and as I said, after the ACA factor, it's dropped away massively, which is really sad. Now, you and I have share a common bond of marketing, media. I also read some names out, Pavola. Brereton, Fletcher, Fletcher, Dane Swan, just to name a few. JWP promotions come out of where we go. Where'd the idea of JWP come from? Stoney, obviously been connected to the game for a long time. I've met some wonderful people over the journey and just want to give back to football and people in general. You know, obviously started the Relive the Rivalry Legends game at the start of 2012. Went back to the Northwest Coast, wasn't well, pushed through that and wanted to prove a point to a few people. But also, I genuinely believe Tasmanian football, we don't get the opportunity to say goodbye to our heroes and we don't get enough of AFL football and we just get uh, um, treated with scant regard. So I started to relive the rivalry and use my contacts that I've met over the journey. And as it's gone on, Stoney, with more people and more people and more people, I think there's a niche in the market here in in Tasmania. It's a, it's a hard sell at Tom Stoney. Clubs are scared to spend money but gone are the days of a fancy dress night or a, or a big raffle for clubs to survive. You've got to move forward and you've got to give yourself an opportunity in those type of events where you bring those type of people, Fev or Swanee or Nicky O, Darrell White, whoever it be, Sam Newman, are genuinely successful and if they're not you'll do better than break even and you give your, op- you give your community and your people within your football club or other sporting clubs something. And it's a buzz factor for the town, like the North West Coast. And I 
I spend, you know, probably six trips a year where I go up the northwest coast and they love those functions and they're generally well attended and they raise good money. I took Barry Hall down to Signet two and a half years ago and there's three and a half thousand people there. That's what you've got to do to move forward. As I said, you, you can have a great time at a fancy dress night or karaoke night and we'll have a laugh and stuff and you'll make a couple of dollars but you don't make the dollars to move forward and give you the club or group an opportunity to move forward and that's what it's about. You have to have vision to run or create events, Leo. I was involved really with the rivalry right from the start. So I want you to tell the viewers how you got the sponsor muscle dystrophy at the start. Now you got Beyond Blue. Yeah. So the vision to have an event like that, to run an event like that, to bring ex-Tasmanians <laughs> that are on the mainland over to over to here from around Australia, yes. Tasmanians to play against uh, Victoria. Where'd that vision come from? Well, I always remember 1990 Tasmania beat Victoria at North Hobart Oval, and yeah, it wasn't their their best team, but we beat Victoria, um, and it was amazing. I think there was about 19,000 people at background behind you, Stoney. It is the home of football in Tasmania, um, and I know the VFL clubs love playing there because it felt like a final because we back when the Devils were flying the three or four thousand people the crowds on top of the football which is awesome mate I was on the kiosk that day wonderful experience awesome for Tasmania to beat Victoria that's never been forgotten with the charity muscular dystrophy Tasmania at the time um, obviously not well recognised I think at the time a chocolate raffle or a quiz night was their biggest fundraiser and my mate's son I really wanted to do something to expose this horrible thing and it wasn't really well known and I think it gave it legs to be honest with you really grateful that in that time in the last six or eight years that Mickey you know, O'Loughlin from the game become an ambassador for muscular dystrophy Tasmania, which I thought was wonderful. In our time, young Lucas has created a wonderful relationship with Christian Petrarca, and that wouldn't have been without Relive the Rivalry. But yeah, mate, obviously they're up and running really well now with the golf day and stuff, and 18 months ago we made a decision to go with Beyond Blue, which resonates with a lot of people connected with the game, but also I think it's really important at the moment, obviously with COVID-19 and stuff, that we know that our money goes to the 24-hour call centre, and I think it's really, really important that um, we support that, because I can hardly imagine what you'll put up with living in Melbourne. I wouldn't have been able to survive how I am. Mate, I just want to give back and, and I want people to have a warm experience and walk away and go, geez, that's good. And unfortunately, you know, he goes for a day or two and we've got to wait another 12 months. So it's a hobby for me, Stoney. Over 12 months, you get blokes on board and you chase your sponsors and so forth. And I've got some wonderful volunteers in the background that do a great job and we're really looking forward to the, the opportunity down the hill in, in October. I think the great thing about it, we've had it at North Hobart, you've had it up at Penguin, and now yes. you're taken to country Tasmania and one of the few most beautiful spots in Tasmania down the Huon and the apples and all the other things. So, But you know what the great thing about it, we go, is that to be able to get collectively a group of people, ex-players at AFL level, VFL level, that still want to come back and give back to the game and come yes. to the communities that we have, you must feel really special to be able to, be able to get those people and collectively get them in a spot where they're playing for the public. That's a really great thing and very proud. Yeah, thanks for that, Stoney. Obviously, mate, I don't do it for that, but it is great. It's more like a family reunion in each year now. Um, there's a number of guys that have played nearly all eight games, which is amazing, and they really look forward to getting back to Tassie. Don't try and overload them with too much. I'm happy for them to sneak in on a Friday, for instance, and have a quiet afternoon and a few drinks and a feed on the Friday night and relax or kick on or whatever it be. We get them from A to B comfortably. We make sure they're transferred from the airports and so forth. I want them to have a warm experience and say, you know what, I want to be involved with this again. One example is Michael Gale, ex Victoria Richmond, and played in the state of origin in 1990. I pestered him badly to play. He never wanted to play one. He said to me last year at Penguin, he's so grateful that he came to game one because he hasn't missed one since and loves it. And I know some of these guys sometimes don't understand that if they just give back a little bit, how much they'll appreciate it or be loved. Fev played in three games and come down to fourth game study where he couldn't play, but he just wanted to come down and sign some autographs for the kids. And to see him walk off the ground and a couple of times and present his jumper to a muscular dystrophy guy from the northwest coast um, was just amazing. And I've said to you before, Stoney, these guys mate. Seriously, some of them, um, unfortunately, the media build up on them or pick on them, but they'd sell more papers writing the good stuff than some of the stuff that they write about. You know, Brendan Vavale's just a great human. Swanee, nothing's too hard, mate. Mickey O, Lachlan, superstar, Daryl White. Mate, I'm missing a lot of guys, but you know what? Some of these guys in the background have assisted with your sponsorship and just made life a lot easier too, and they believe in what we're trying to do. And I suppose uh, one person, and I'll mention him, Sean Smith, who's been on the show before, it's been his own struggles in recent times, but is in really good space, has been a really big player in the uh, Relive the Rivalry over the years we go. So hopefully Sean can get down and uh, 
probably not play, but be involved with it? Oh, he'll be involved, mate. Obviously, um, really pleased that he's come on, mate, with his with his business and his hobby, he's come on board as the premium sponsor of the game. So that gives you an indication. Simon Atkins, another one, you know, with the Elliot's Crane Eye from day one. Justin Metcalf with Luxbury, who I know you've interviewed. Yeah. Uh, Paul Hudson with Electronic Signage Australia and Harvey Norman in the past. Mate, there's some wonderful people that believe in what we're doing or what I'm doing, and uh, I think it's fantastic. And they, they just want to keep the dream alive. Mate, I guess while the energy's there, we'll keep doing it. But um, going back to Smithy just quickly, it's fantastic to see where he's at. I spent some time with him probably six or eight weeks ago in Melbourne, uh, snuck over for two days. It actually gave me a buzz to go out to a workshop and mess around with a bit of timber and learn how to make a chopping board. I, I couldn't believe it. And I walked away, and I've never had any interest in woodwork or metalwork, and I thought to myself, geez, that was good. And it was really amazing. And I know uh, another guy that I've tried to get the Tassie who's been caught up with COVID-19, 19 issues, Bomber Thompson. He's now recycling timber and furniture, and he's in a fantastic place. And him and Smithy have liaised, and they've gone to the footy together and checked out each other's storerooms or warehouses or whatever you want to call it. And they're really good places, and I think that's fantastic. This year is very special, James, because it's a very special year. Not only are you taking the game to the human, you're marrying the lovely Natasha. Now, yes. the game's on the Saturday, and you're getting married on the Sunday. You've done that well because most of the people at the game will be at the wedding. So that's a very good point, James. <laughs> I know most people that know me very well, Stoney, would think that I've organised this, but I haven't. It was Natasha's idea. She said 60%, 70% of the people involved with the game um, will invite to the wedding. And I just thought, oh, yeah, you're probably right. Mate, there might be a few dusty heads and stuff, but um, they're obviously very – at 48, Stoney, and I've had some hurdles and obstacles the last 10 years in particular. To find someone who's so supportive and understanding and pushes me with really the rivalry, JWP being involved with the OHA footy club and just general life is just amazing. And I've got to say this as well, my past partner did me a favour. I mean that, did me a favour because I probably wouldn't have been here without Natasha. So yeah, looking forward to Stoney and um, it's going to be a special weekend. I don't know who's going to look after me, probably you because you're my best man. So you'll have to look after him <laughs> for night to make sure I get to the wedding. But um, That's right. It's going to be a great weekend. I'm really grateful for the outstanding support so far from the Hewlettville Football Club. They're a wonderful footy club down here in the Southern Football League that are striving for sustained success. They won the flag last year, but also they're a very good community-based football club. They just want to be involved. They're not in it for any other reason. They would love it to be down there permanently. And I've said it before, Stoney, and you know this, if, if we get two or 3,000 people, and that's all we've ever asked for, then we'll keep the game there. It deserves to go to the people that want the game. And as you say, we've had five or six games in Hobart, one at Utah one on the northwest coast that probably one of the best facilities in Tasmania are underutilised. To take it to the Hewan and how much football means to those people, I know Hewanville Sydney can still get a couple of thousand people to a roster game, which is in Tasmania is crazy. That's what we remember from the 80s and 90s and stuff. So uh, we're really looking forward to it and uh, you'll be a part of that day too, mate. If you're watching this show and you live in uh, Melbourne or anywhere in Australia and uh, you want a game of football and we can fly, let's hopefully COVID's not up with us then because I've got to get to Tasmania for the wedding. So that's, uh, I've got to get it for the game too, but it's on October the 10th, James? 9th. 9th, mate. The wedding's the 10th. (laughs) I knew knew that. But before we go, we go, there's one person I want to mention. You know, you've had a couple of footy clubs over the years, but this year you've been involved with OHA and uh, your little mate Ian Cullen. And uh, he's been on this show too in the past. And so to see Wingnut, you know, he's got his moments, but he's going okay. He means the world to me, the little fella, even though he's a prick from Clarence Football Club initially. Uh, We built a relationship when he was playing with the Tassie Devils, kept in contact when he was in Adelaide. Probably one of the greatest regrets I've got in my football background is not getting over to Adelaide to see him play a game. So proud of him. He means the world to me. We had a super time last year. It was gutted in uh, early August when he when he found out about the stroke and bits and pieces. Fortunately enough, obviously he's on the, the rebound. Um, he's still in recovery mode. He's doing a wonderful job. Very much loved and, you know, as I said, my commitments to him and uh, Tim Carter, Big Turbo, two really important people in my life, those people. So I'm um, dedicated to those two and, you know, mate, we've got another five weeks to see where it ends up that um, we're giving ourselves every chance of um, having a bit of fun later in the year. Hey, we go, I'll ask you one last question, mate. I suppose that JWP Promotions, your own business, where do you want to take JWP? What would you like to see happen with JWP? You know, man, I just think that um, I'm really fortunate. I've probably got two or 300 contacts and, mate, you've supported me massively too over the journey to create this as well. So um, I just think people need to have a bit of vision and look, look over their back fence and go, how do we take our group or our club forward? And there's some great opportunities not only for guest speakers, but one-off games and stuff, and they, they, they certainly make a hell of a difference. A lot of football clubs and, and sporting groups in Tasmania stick to the 
old stock standard things. Take it on, have a look and, and test the water because I'm sure you'll be pretty happy. But also what I'll say is engage your members, engage your players who all know people that should be involved and they're the ones that should take the pressure off the club volunteers. Get them to sell some tickets. People have a warm experience. Then they want to go to the next one and then they're telling their friends and all of a sudden football clubs or sporting groups go from 100 to 200 to 300 and then people are missing out on going because they know that, you know, as I said, when I was at Burnie, we had the best functions on the northwest coast. When I was at Devonport, I'll back in that we had the best functions there as well. And then at Glenorchy for a period of time I was there, we had some wonderful nights there as well. So, and of course, Werribee do it very, very well. So, mate, there's money to be made, but also giving back to your community and your people in general. It's not going to happen by just opening the doors and having a pie night and chook raffle. It's not going to happen. So, uh, I've got a Facebook page, James Wiggins Promotions. Uh, there's a website, www.jameswigginspromotions.com.au. I'm here to help. And you know what? If there's not a name there that interests you, but there may be someone else that you would like, just touch base and, and we'll chase them. Whether it be Mark Stone or someone that we know in the, uh, the footy world on the mainland, we'll chase the number down and we'll get hold of that person. And I can promise you, Stoney, as you know, I don't deal with managers. I deal directly with the people. So please, there's opportunities there and put a smile on people's faces and, and that's what it's about. And one thing, Stoney, if you don't mind, uh, I'd love to send my prayers and wishes to Ryan Wiggins as well. He's still in the world, world of hurt in Melbourne, I understand. I suffered a freak accident a couple of weeks ago. May have busted his neck. Um, I believe he's in the Austin Hospital. There's been some wonderful fundraising going with the GoFundMe page and I know the Lord of our Football Club signet and so forth, and we at OHA and through Rude the rivalry raise money too. So, yeah, thoughts and prayers with Ron. I'll just finish off by saying all sports, all associations, we go, there's a lot of people in the industry, and uh, if you want a fundraiser or you're looking to do something unique and special, make sure you look out for JWP Promotions. We go, thank you thank for you, joining Mark. me on the Mark Show, A1 TV. Look out for this man. He's a good man. Thanks for the opportunity, Stoney. Cheers, mate. Thank you.